Hello, good evening, and welcome to this evening's BIC Streams session, marking 75 years of the United Nations. UN at 75, the future beckons. A few weeks ago, right around the time of the actual anniversary, we had a group of spirited millennials who were veteran uh, alums of the model UN. And they gave us the lowdown of, of uh, how they do it. Some great anecdotes on the super competitive and life-changing experience and the atmos at atmosphere of the moon, as they call it, the model UN. Today, we have stepped out of make-believe and are here with individuals involved in the real thing with potential of actually changing lives in a very real sense. As a millennial myself who has had a changing relationship with the image and relevance of the UN over the uh, last three decades and having immensely enjoyed the young people's model UN session, I really am looking forward to this one. It is my pleasure, pleasure to introduce you to Renata Desalien, uh, Vijay Nambiar and Salil Shetty. Their full bios will appear in the chat boxes and you may post your questions in the Q&A box, which uh, the speakers will address at the end of the session. And with that, over to you, Salil. So uh, first of all, thank you to all the participants who've joined us today. Uh, I, and thanks to Bangalore International Center for hosting this conversation on this very important topic. Um, I think it's very timely because there's big changes in the way the current government in India is dealing with the world and how it sees India's role in the world. So that's from the domestic perspective. Uh, even more recent, of course, is a very big change uh, in the US, which has happened. And uh, we'll come to this in more detail later. Um, of course, you know, when governments change, uh, policies do change, but foreign policy changes tend to be not tectonic. Normally the shifts, uh, you, you don't see it overnight. You, it, it happens, but it's less visible. So I think I'm very uh, pleased that we have, uh, and very fortunate, I think, that we have Renata and uh, Vijay with, with us here. The, their, their details are with you. Um, but for sure, Renata has worked in the neighborhood in many countries. So she's led the UN in several neighboring countries, and of course, now in India. And uh, Vijay is, uh, you know, able to, um, Vijay will give us more of a global perspective because he's worked at the UN um, at the highest level. He's probably one of the senior most people we've had in the UN from, from India. He worked with the two Secretary Generals, both uh, Kofi Annan and Ban Ki-moon. So we're very, very fortunate to have them with us. Um, it's a very polarized time in the world. Uh, it's polarized in India, it's polarized in the world. And we almost have alternative universes with the people not really talking to each other much. Um, and funnily enough, the UN is, you know, or rather not so surprisingly, the UN is often caught in the crossfire in the middle um, as it's meant to be neutral. So I, I always remember the, the Palestine situation, for example. So all the Palestinians would say that the UN is so pro-Israel and so biased towards the US. And then of course, uh, all the Israelis would say the, exactly the opposite about the UN. So, you know, that's the, you, it's a thankless place to be in. Some of the criticisms, of course, are justified. And, uh, but, uh, you know, the UN could do more in many situations. That's true. But at the same time, a lot of it is just ill-informed and not justified. But either way, um, that's where you are. You're sitting in the middle and you, you have to deal with it. Uh, but I'm hoping that somehow this conversation, uh, despite, I mean, uh, I think, uh, Lekha mentioned that we are moving in, uh, out of the make-believe world, but this Zoom world remains a bit make-believe. But we'll see as to whether we can get Renata and Vijay to, you know, they are, I mean, Renata is a serving diplomat. At least Vijay has more flexibility, but I'm hoping that both of them will relax and give us a more, you know, open and candid kind of view of uh, what they think. But uh, we will dive straight into it uh, just for the benefit of the participants. You'll hear less of my voice after this introduction because we really want to hear from Renata and Vijay. We want to structure it broadly in say three parts. Uh, we want to first talk about the UN and India and, the, and India and the UN. So that's kind of one, one part of it, uh, if you wish. The second is we want to talk about the role of civil society in the UN and you know how that works out. So that's the second part. And the third part we want to talk about is the changing 
reality with the Biden administration coming in, what does it mean um, for the UN, for, uh, for, for India? And, and of course, the other elephant in the room is China. So, you know, we, we can't almost, these days we can't talk about the US without talking about China. So, and there Vijay would, I'm sure, have a much uh, sort of louder voice on the subject. So, so without uh, further ado, I just want to get straight into it, uh, Renata, and I kind of thank you. I think it's, uh, I'm sorry, Vijay, you're having difficulties hearing us, but I hope you're hearing us enough to be able to speak when you're when, when a question is directed yeah. towards you. Yes. Uh, but for now, just asking the first question for Renata, because, and, and this is what, just to kick us off and kind of, it's almost like a warm up about the history of uh, the UN in India. And we know, of course, you know, those of us who are kind of UN uh, watchers, etc. We know that the League of Nations had India at the kind of center of it. We know about, you know, about the ECOSOC presidency with Akot Mudaliar, Ramchand Mudaliar. We had Vijay Lakshmi Pandit, whose uh, death anniversary we just had a, couple, a day or two ago, who was the first woman uh, president of the UN General Assembly. So there's a kind of a rich history, and, and I'm sure you will touch on that, Renata. But, but having said I think if you ask the average person like on the street in India about the UN in India, they probably still say, what exactly does the UN do in India? You know, what, what, what happens? What have they done? What do they do now? So why don't you, you know, give us your take on that and, and let's get it going from there. Renata, over to you. Okay, thank you so much. First of all, I want to really thank the um, Bangalore International Center for organizing this meeting. Um, this is, as uh, you know, the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. Um, I think at the beginning of the year, we were thinking of commemorating the anniversary in a different way, but of course, COVID has turned all our lives upside down and including our commemoration of our, of our 75th anniversary. And I like any, any anniversary, um, this is a good time to think back, uh, to think about um, the current and also to think about the future. So I'll be flitting back and forth across these different time horizons, if, if you will. So Lil, also thank you so much um, for mentioning some of the challenges that the United Nations faces. I mean, when we're doing a good job, we get criticized from both, both parties that we may be trying to pull together. In fact, that's almost like a, a, a signal to us that, that we're, just, we're doing just right, that both parties that we're trying to help <laughs> are critical of us. But it's not just you know, our work to try to bring uh, parties together to find uh, peaceful solutions to tensions and to conflict. Um, through dialogue and through expanding uh, mutual understanding, but it's also sort of the relationship between UN and the world generally. And there's another uh, lovely ac um, phrase that I like to quote, particularly in this year, is that the UN is one of those organizations that tends to get caught um, in the crossfire between uncritical lovers and unloving critics. Um, and so uh, I think, um, you know, the UN, I mean, basically the UN was established to appeal to our higher angels, as they say. And uh, so right from the beginning, um, it's been a tough job <laughs> because uh, appealing to humanity's higher angels is, um, is, is uh, as I say, it's a, it's, it's a tall task. Nevertheless, I'd like to spend a few minutes on um, the relationship between India and the UN. Uh, and of course, it's a two-way relationship. In fact, it's even more than a two-way relationship. On the one hand, India has offered tremendous um, contributions to the UN, and I'll go into a few of them. You've mentioned a few yourself, Salil, but the UN has also done uh, work for India. And I think the UN-India relationship has even gone further than this and influenced um, uh, and informed at least, uh, and I think to some extent influenced how India um, responds globally. So let me, let me, let me um, populate that um, a little bit. First of all, I think uh, many people may not know, but India was a founding member, one of the 50 founding members of the United Nations way back um, 75 years ago. And not only that, India has um, made significant contributions to shaping the, the values and principles of the UN over, over the years. I mean, age old concepts derived within India, like ahimsa, nonviolence, or sarbodhya, upliftment of all, or Vasudeva Kutumbakam, the world is one family. These, these principles are, are deeply embedded in India um, and have been offered to the UN. 
India, I can give you know, for some examples also of what um, India has, has left as a mark on, on the UN. If we take, for example, way back in the drafting of you know, our, how shall I say, our, 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 I mean, in addition to the charter, the, probably the most important um, instrument of the United Nations is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And uh, it was Hansa Mehta from India who ensured that the final text of the Universal Declaration refers to all human beings created equal and not all men are created equal because that was the draft that came across her desk and she would have nothing of that, thank goodness. Um, in addition, Lakshmi Menon in, in, insisted that in the, in the text, in the body of the declaration, there actually be a references specifically to women's rights and not just to all people's rights. Um, so that's another, um, how should I say, important contribution from a normative perspective that we can attribute to India. Um, but there have been so many contributions over, over the years. Way back in 1956, it was uh, Binoy Rajan Sen, who at that time was heading FAO, who basically de developed the landmark Freedom from Hunger campaign, the first uh, Freedom from Hunger campaign. Um, and uh, I take, for example, the, the field of peace and security. India's uh, contributing the largest cumulative number of uh, troops to into peacekeeping operations around the world, about 50 of them over, over the years. Uh, but not only that, has also contributed 15 force commanders and contributed the very, very first all-female peacekeeping contingent to, um, to the UN for their mission in Liberia in 2007. And in addition to that, India has contributed many of its best and brightest. We have Vijay Nambiar with us. On, uh, on this program. So he's an, he's, a, he's an enormous contribution, I would say, to the thinking and to the steering of the UN at the very highest, um, highest levels. And in addition to him, he, there are many, many other uh, peers of his who have contributed in various forms, not just at the top echelon, but throughout the organization in big and smaller ways. So, um, and, and if, you, if you look also at some of the big agendas, the development agendas, the formulation of the SDGs, for example, was, was deeply shaped um, by, by thinking from India, not just the, the government of India, but many, many civil society organizations across India. The Paris Agreement, um, India in many respects came to the rescue <laughs> at, the, at, the, at the Paris, um, at Paris uh, conference, uh, climate change conference. And uh, India will be joining the Security Council, as everyone knows, it's in the media a lot these days for the eighth time, um, starting this January, and will, I'm sure, make some significant contributions, at least uh, to pushing for reforms. We hope that they will actually succeed. These are really hard uh, reforms to, to push through in terms of the membership of the Security Council, but other aspects of the UN as well. So India has made very significant contributions to the UN. And then in terms of the UN's contribution to India, um, they go back and they're actually uh, as old as India's, uh, as old as the UN itself. And in fact, even older, if you take the International Labour Organization, they opened their first office in India back in 1928, way before the UN was established and before India's independence. And uh, over the years, the, the number of agencies with active programs in India have grown in leaps and bounds. There are now 26 UN entities based in India, working across all 28 state, uh, states. And um, I know that we're a drop in the ocean to, compared to India's fast development processes and, and needs, but we are working in very close cooperation with government at central um, state and local levels, with civil society, with private sector, um, basically with everybody who will partner with us, we, we partner. And um, there have been, I think, some important contributions, particularly through some of the big uh, nationwide policies and missions like Poshan Abiyan or Aishman Bharat or the Jal Javin mission, where particular UN agencies have made, I think, significant uh, contributions. If you take something very concrete like vaccination, everyone's talking about vaccination now because of the COVID vaccine. Um, but in terms of regular vac vaccinations, the UN has basically helped vaccinate 300 million children in India over the last three years. Um, and we are you know, working since COVID-19 hit us, we repurposed a number of our programs very rapidly. 
and uh, are for example we're able for example in a few months of course with partnerships to train over um, 3.8 million frontline health and sanitation workers on COVID preparedness and response protocols. We were we reached something like over 6 million, 600 million people with um, messaging on risk mitigation. And um, you know, we're working also to assist on the socioeconomic recovery because as you know, COVID has, has a health challenge, a huge health challenge, but also equally huge uh, challenges in terms of impact on social, social and economic issues. So, yeah. so I think um, there, there's this two-way street, but uh, India also, as I mentioned, I think is, is, is taking some of, of what it's, how should, something, some of what's been curated in the relationship between India and the UN to its work abroad. And I'm referring mainly to some of the SDG infused um, programs and projects that it funds abroad. And I'm referring also to the, um, the $150 million that they put into the India UN Development Partnership Fund, which is specifically to help uh, countries from the South, developing countries from the South, to accelerate progress along the SDGs. So I'll stop there. I think I've taken too much time already. No, no, as I said, Renata, that was just a warming up. So we'll now, <laughs> we'll, it'll get, uh, you know, we'll, we'll keep it shorter, I think, the responses from here on. But Vijay, uh, I, I did want to ask you, I hope you're able to hear me, that, you know, would you like to add anything to what Renata has said? And then I, I, I want to go back to Renata and, you know, uh, do my devil's okay. advocate. But, but uh, why don't you add first, Vijay? Very good. Let me just take a, take a slightly, well, a, a slightly broader view, perhaps, because, uh, uh, <clears throat> Renata has already given a very, very, uh, very precise and uh, fairly exhaustive uh, indication of India and the UN and the UN and India. <clears throat> but let me just put a slide some of different uh, aspects of it. You know, <clears throat> the first thing is why has the how has the UN survived so long? Before just in general terms, right? because it has constantly reinvented itself. Right? Because the, the for example, in the 70, 75 years it has lasted. The league lasted less than 10, 15 years because it was moribund by, by about, in about 12 years or so. Now, that is because it has reinvented itself, but, and it has moved from various fields from the Cold War, for an example, India played a very, very major role in terms of uh, apartheid, anti-apartheid, in terms of decolonization during the times of in the 50s and the 60s. And I think that is something which I think, in a sense, changed the UN and changed the world. Because though the Cold War <clears throat> was, uh, it, it was a, it was the, the Cold War was the predominant kind of uh, scenario, and uh, Dag Hammarskjöld talked of not so much taking people to heaven, but of preventing hell from uh, from prevail, from uh, this, from uh, prevailing. And uh, it was Nehru, in a sense, who in the fifties, etc., was very active internationally, both in the field of nuclear disarmament and in trying to prevent an outbreak of nuclear confrontation between the two made uh, to the two poles and at the same time also was the voice of the newly decolonized world and i think these are very important contributions which india has made subsequently in the non-aligned particularly for the in fact <clears throat> in some ways one must say that the first uh, uh, 50 years 40 years perhaps but even 50 years you can say the first 25 years the people's republic of china was not at all in the un but for the next 25 years almost they were, lit, they were almost uh, somewhat, uh, you know, hesitant. Uh, they were uh, concentrating purely on purely bilateral and therefore not very active multilaterally, even though they were permanent members of the, of the Security Council. But it was at those, in those years that Indian diplomacy was fairly active, though there were, of course, various issues relating to, for example, Kashmir, and then subsequently Jammu and Kashmir, and subsequently, uh, in the in 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 areas like during the seventy one, when uh, I think <clears throat> the uh, the entire world, uh, the large sections of the even the non-aligned had voted against India in in the Bangladesh in terms of Bangladesh independence, but the people's the opinion of the people around the world was supportive of this action. And while the concept of of uh, humanitarian intervention and responsibility to protect came much later and was supported internationally in issues like 
the preventing genocide from happening in two, in two major areas. For example, in uh, 1971 in Bangladesh and subsequently in uh, Cambodia. <clears throat> in fact, India went against the tide in what, what it felt was morally important to, to take a stand. And in fact, it uh, uh, was one of the harbingers of, is of, uh, uh, of major issues like human the responsibility to protect, even though subsequently as, in it, as when it came, the, the concept itself uh, came up with a whole lot of baggage and that, and, and of course the, the non-aligned as a whole did have very strong sovereignty issues, et cetera, and that was different. Now, in terms of reinventing itself, again, the other point is the UN, it is not only the political, but growing, moving out in many ways the, on the economic, the three pillars which, uh, which uh, Kofi Annan had talked about on the economic and human rights aspects. So, Renata, I was, I was going to say that, you know, like often it's been said that the Secretary General of the UN has the most difficult job in the world. So, you know, whether it's Kofi Annan or Guterres, because you're always, you know, in the middle and everybody is unhappy with you. So, would, would you say that you have the second most difficult job in the world as the resident coordinator of the UN in India? Or would you say, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's <laughs> pleasant? <laughs> So first of all, um, I don't think about it because uh, it is extremely challenging. The, the UN's work, no, I'm not talking specifically about India, I'm just saying that uh, the role of a resident coordinator is extremely challenging. But if I were to think about it, I probably wouldn't actually be able to do anything. So I don't think about it. I think that the SG certainly has the hardest job in the world. Uh, although uh, sometimes I think that the executive director of WHO right now has an even harder job. Um, but uh, be that as it may. So I think, um, yeah, now, as I said, you know, when, when you're sick, if you keep thinking that you're sick, you feel worse and worse. So if I just kept thinking how difficult it is, I, I wouldn't be able to do my job. So I don't think about it that way. And I also um, um, think that it's just about India because you said in India. And um, uh, for me, it's been a lifelong dream to come to India. I have heard about, I had heard, of course, I'd visited India before as well. So for me, it's an absolute total joy and delight to be able to work in, in India in spite of the conditions now. And behind me, by the way, is uh, the Ganges River flowing. Ah, nice. No, but Renata, the reason I'm asking you this is because, you know, um, Vijay made passing reference to Kashmir, yeah. you know, with the plebiscite that was promised. And then um, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, whether it be Zaid or uh, now Michelle Bachelet, has, you know, raised concerns about human rights issues in India. And, uh, you know, that's not been received very nicely by the government. And, and no government in India receives human rights criticisms easily. So it's not special to this particular government, but this government is, you know, has an even more kind of robust kind of pushing back system. You made a, I thought a relatively innocuous statement on after the Hathras, uh, you know, incident. And again, we had a kind of quick, uh, you know, pushback from the Ministry of External Affairs. I mean, today or yesterday, President Trudeau said something about farmers protest. And of course you saw, you know, they didn't like that either. I suppose at, on, on the one hand, fair enough, you know, what Vijay said, sovereignty and, you know, we have to mind, everybody has to mind their own business. Uh, but then at the same time, you know, it's the job of the UN to speak up on these issues. So how do you balance this? Okay, so um, yeah, thanks, Salil. I think um, as you were pointing out in the very beginning, you know, you referred to the, 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 the conflict uh, between Israel and um, Palestinians and the fact that, um, you know, generally the UN is, 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 is caught between a rock and a hard place. And our job, uh, we have many, many aspects of the of the work that we are responsible for. Um, you know very well. You know, there's peace and security, there's human rights, um, there's humanitarian response, and there's the development. And each of these each of these branches are working, um, you know, for particular purposes at different times. Uh, all of our work is grounded in you know the principles of peace and human rights for all. So everything that we do, we try to serve, you know, serve those ends. Um, and sometimes it's easier than, 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 than otherwise. 
Um, we're also, um, you know, an, uh, essentially an intergovernmental body. I mean, our design is as intergovernmental and um, we work in countries at the behest and uh, of governments. And so uh, that the UN finds itself, you know, sometimes in difficult situations is natural. Um, I think that, uh, you know, Vijay referred to the fact that, you know, the UN is also evolving immensely over time. Um, and, and I mentioned just right now that the fact that uh, in, in our design features, we were designed as an intergovernmental body, but we work very, very, very closely with all sorts of uh, organizations now and, um, and very closely with civil society organizations because a lot of our work, we, we you know, particularly our humanitarian work, we couldn't actually do without, without civil society organizations. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, you know, we stand for, for many, um, many principles and values we try to pursue that through different um, channels. Each channel has its roles and responsibilities um, to, to pursue the uh, objectives, you know, uh, the given to them by their, their mandate. And we try, to, we try to make it work as best we can overall. Right. So Vijay, the, I don't know if you heard the question I asked uh, Renata. No, no, saying, no. So if you could please. Question, yeah, right. and since you're not, in, you're not holding a position right now, you can, take your gloves off maybe because uh, I my question was that you know yes we have this kind of nice romantic relationship between India and the UN UN and India but at the same time you know when uh, Michelle Bachelet asks questions about a uh, human rights record or Zaid does the same or you know uh, for that matter Renata says something about Hathras there is a kind of quick pushback from the government right saying oh sovereignty you know this is let's mind our own business w what's your take on this? I think this is an old question. It is not as if, you know, we have actually as a, as, a, as a culture, as a political culture, I think we are given to <clears throat> a lot of self-criticism and argumentation. And I think we take as much as we give internally. So why can't we do it internationally? And I think internationally, in fact, uh, I think even though the government tends to be very sensitive, the people are not. And you can see, I mean, some of the most uh, ha the hardest critics, even internationally, uh, of India's policies are Indians. It's not really so much. And I think we have to take it internationally also. And from that point of view, there are some issues on which, of course, most, most uh, uh, I mean, th there is a certain amount, let's say, of, uh, on, on issues like uh, national security. I think there, there probably is a certain self-restraining ordinance which most people do. But government tends always to be a little more protective and a little more uh, you know, conscious of, of uh, criticism and what that will do to the, national, to the national image, et cetera. But in fact, I think we have noticed over the years, and I think in general, we can say that uh, it is because of the NGO, the civil society community in India uh, that has been so active on most issues or perhaps less on political issues than on other non-political issues, whether it's whether it's climate change, whether it's human rights, whether it, oh, but human rights tends to get politicized. But even on, uh, for example, Kailash Satyarthi, Satyarthi's activities. Now, initially, I used to see myself, people used to be very, uh, <clears throat> very wary about meeting him just because he used to, you know, in a sense, uh, you show a dirty linen in public, as it were, internationally. But actually, the kind of contribution he made is now accepted by most people inside the country also, and the international. Same is to be said for Vandana Shiva, for Surita Narayan, and various people like that. And I think this is something which is increasingly accepted. And whereas earlier, even in the UN, you used to see uh, the UN division in the Ministry of Ex External Affairs, there was much sort of uh, wariness shown to engaging with, uh, with no, NGOs and civil society. Now that is no longer there because the nature of the UN and the nature of our involvement with the UN has changed. And I think while inevitably uh, we do, uh, governments and uh, the foreign office will make certain comments, but I think they make it as a, in, in the normal course as a statement of official policy. But actually there is a, there is, I think, an acceptance that the, uh, that the public opinion inside India need not necessarily be of the same. And eventually, 
policy has changed in India in response to this particular, these particular counter, you know, the various uh, uh, pressures and counter pressures. And I think Renata will be seeing it in, in, uh, in many ways, even in her relationship with the UN, uh, with, the, with the Indian government, different uh, departments respond differently. And as long as you are actually dealing with them quietly and not making public statements, etc., there's a tremendous amount of responsiveness that is shown. Publicly, obviously, there is a certain worry about a public image and things like that. And even there, I think, by and large, uh, in dis different governments, of course, the ways in which the governments respond, perhaps today, in, in line with the, with the growing kind of nationalism around the world, perhaps we are a little more sensitive. But uh, and in, in, if we talk about Chinese wolf warrior diplomacy, I'm a little worried that as India grows economically and in terms of its international projection, uh, internationally it grows more and more strong, we probably displace the same kind of, you know, of uh, attitudes with respect to treatment and to respect to criticism from outside. I hope we do not, because we have a much greater open society and we are used to getting uh, a kind of criticism. I think that even though ministries and government uh, spokesmen will be sensitive and will perhaps be prickly, it is generally accepted that we do respond to this kind of change in terms of how it impacts on policy. And that can be so, seen in many areas. So let me let me go back to Renata now, because in a sense, you know, she, what the point you're making, Vijay, is, you know, Governments will say what they have to say, and you know, yeah. but people will speak up. But I mean, Renata has to deal with the government, right? So, Renata, let me come back to you. So, the charter starts by saying we the people, and you know, we, we are, it's all about people. But I mean, then you said we are an intergovernmental organization, and I understand that we have to do this juggling thing. But, but I mean, in the end, I mean, you know, the UN is uh, I, because this kind of goes back to the first point we started discussing as to how do people perceive the UN. You know, across the world, and it does lead to frustration. Say, you know, why are these people not speaking up, or why are they not doing taking some action? But the reality is, you're intergovernmental organization. So, you know, much as we may say that we are everything, I mean, you can't be fish and fowl at the same time, can you, Renata? Well, I think um, first of all, in the follow up to something that VJ said, uh, there is tremendous openness by large parts of the Indian government, and I'm talking not only the central government, but also state governments and, and local governments to work with us and to work with us even on delicate issues that are sensitive. And so to say that we're not uh, doing it is incorrect, um, but it's a question of how you do it, like everything in life. It's a question of how you how you do this. And I think, um, I think that it's, uh, you know, some of it will be less visible than others. I'm not saying that all of it will be invisible. There are parts of the system that are working very visibly on the kinds of issues that you're referring to. And parts of the system will inevitably, in order to be most effective at it, will be working more quietly and more discreetly. But that's not just on sensitive issues. In general, in, in countries like India, and when I say like India, I guess there's no other country really like India, but, um, and, and maybe it's a more generalized statement in countries overall, they don't like it to, you know, when, when the UN's work gets center stage in general. They prefer it because, because we're, we were designed to help them achieve results. When I say help them, I mean, not only the government, but the country. And, uh, and, and governments prefer to be on the front line in terms of, of, of how, how our work is perceived. Some, some, some governments are more strict about it. Some of them you know, won't let the UN um, have a kind of separate face if you, if you, if you like, and, 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 and others are more, more flexible. So, so here in India, of course, it's much more flexible. And at the same time, uh, the government would prefer that some aspects of our work is, is actually, um, particularly since it's happening so, um, how should I say, in, in such a close partnership, if I just take, for example, response to COVID-19, COVID some of the work that is going on now between the UN system and the government is extremely, extremely close. Um, and, and of course, it's the government that needs to, is on the front line, they need to respond to this, this virus. And it wouldn't help, uh, you know, to, to toot our horn, so to speak, and to, you know, try to get recognition for this or, this or that. So we don't do it. 
Um, so that's one aspect of it. The second thing is you mentioned, you know, we the people, but but who's we the people are we talking about? I mean, in a democratic society, um, representatives of parliament will will say that they are representing we the people, right? They were elected to represent we the people. And I know that democratic systems around the world are are, are, are imperfect and, and um, fragile in spite of being the least worst form of government, they're fragile, they have flaws. And so that uh, just because you have a responsibility doesn't necessarily mean you always perform that responsibility perfectly. But nevertheless, I think that you know elected governments have a have, a, have certainly a, a right to say that they represent the people. Um, so do civil society. Civil society groups obviously represent the people. So who's we the people are we talking about? Um, I think you know we need to be we need to be clear on that. And of course, of course, um, different groups and different associations and different governments will or and even members of the same government may see things differently, right? And I mean, that's the whole reason that the UN was, was established was because the, this, this is a very diverse humanity that we're dealing with and, uh, and uh, not everybody sees eye to eye. So the whole idea is how to bring people together in diversity for greater, yeah. greater unity. So I think that when, when we're talking about, you know, pursuing the wishes of we the people, I mean, the answer to who, who's we the people is, I mean, there, there are different realities out there and each of them needs to be addressed each of i mean it's no good to say your reality doesn't count because it obviously does count and it backfires if you don't you know give space for it so you know we we try to work with everybody to try to you know honor the diversity which is a great strength and move towards greater unity in that diversity thanks uh, vijay i i just want i will come to you in a minute i i just going to say to Renata, in relation to who represents the people in India is a, a very interesting question because, I mean, if you go by a kind of the pure electoral kind of arithmetic, about one third of our people don't vote, about one third votes for the ruling party and one third votes for the opposition. So that's just the reality of the way our democracy is panning out. And so, yeah, a lot of people can claim that we represent the people uh, in the first past the post system. Whoever makes it past the post is then claiming to represent the country. And it's whether it's party A or party B, the, the fact, as you said, is that two thirds of the people are not necessarily representing the people if you go by their voting preferences. But uh, I was going to pass it on to Vijay who wanted to say something, but Vijay, I was gonna add a kind of a question there because you know it is true and this is not just an India thing, right? Globally, I know many of the global NGOs, we've had these discussions on international civil society meetings that, you know, if the UN has become a sort of a toothless tiger, then should we not put our resources behind the World Bank, the IMF, you know, or whatever WTO, the ones who make the real decisions in the world? I'm sure you've come across this kind of an argument as well, saying that, because ultimately, what does the UN do? They issue a statement, right? That's what they can do at best. So outside of the Security Council, they don't have any way of, you know, enforcing uh, anything that normatively they may pronounce. So please add a response to that as you were saying whatever you wanted to say well uh, let me let me respond to just add to what uh, renata has been saying and what you are saying too you know we the people at the, at this at, at the start of the preamble of the united nations came almost by afterthought it was this virginia gildersleeve who was a professor of english literature who added this actually jan smuts who actually wanted to had wanted to uh, prepare the preamble and was actually tasked to prepare the preamble did it almost in the same way as the as the League of Nations. It was like any treaty. But that kind of thing, as it happens, came worked to great advantage because of the evolution of the UN. And I think that is very important. And if you notice, we the people as part of the UN is mainly talked about not by the members of the of the General Assembly. They talk about it, it's the sec secretariat which talks about it more than anybody else. And I think it is with good reason. It is because you need to go beyond the government in terms of advocacy. In many areas of advocacy, not necessarily, we talk always only of the political, even in the in developmental areas particularly, there's a lot that needs to be done beyond the government. And it is clear that the UN is an intergovernmental agency. There's no, it's an intergovernmental organization and any decision to be taken, it has to be the government of the day, the, the representative who votes are there. So it's not as if uh, the only perhaps example of uh, 
where the uh, an NGO has gotten entirely is the 90s when the landmines convention. Vijay, I think we've lost you again. Renata, are you able to hear Vijay? No, no we've lost no. him. So let's go to Renata. I, I okay, mean... sorry. I think Vijay gets excited and presses the when... mute button. <laughs> okay, I'm uh, sorry. <laughs> it's a, okay. I, it's a, the, a call has come and that's all. Anyway, let I me see. tell you, let, the, you know, the question is, it is important that the government, uh, that the government responds to decisions and makes decisions as a legally constituted government. But at the same time, the UN can't be precluded from reaching out to the larger community in, the, in each country. And for the larger community to reach out to the UN also through various means. And that is what has been recognized today. And I think that increasingly, for example, uh, Ban Ki-moon uh, during his, I think in 2016 or perhaps, no, 2012 or 13, he, he went to, he paid a visit to Mumbai in terms of, uh, for the SD, SDG kind of, uh, in, in terms of SDGs, and he actually met with mostly civil society people and businessmen. He met the Ambani's. He talked to the to the hall to Bollywood. He went to the Kama Hospital, and then he spent a few hours on his way back in Delhi and talked to the government. Now, this would have been, uh, I mean, any government would have taken great umbrage at this and would not have allowed it. But the government of India did allow it because it was seen as part of an outreach. And I think that is an important area of the UN's work today, because though decisions are taken by the governments, it is actually in any system for it, for things to function, as you said, just for it to be more than just a piece of paper and a decision by the, by, uh, by the, secure, by the General Assembly, you, it needs to be believed in by people. And I think that is happening increasingly through the various networks that the UN has been create, creating. And the government, while it obviously as government needs to have the last word, it does not actually object to this kind of outreach. And I think that's how decisions are being taken. And that's what the updating of the United Nations really represents. And I think it's important that we recognize this. While that happens, I must mention to you that you know we talk about the UN have been recreating itself, but it has at the same time, certain things have never changed. For example, the veto, the power of the veto, the power of the P5 has never changed. Why is that? Because that is the reflection of the, of the power system in the world. Now that power system is changing now today. And that change has to be reflected in the decision making. And if it doesn't change, as you said, something will happen and you will find that the people will be going increasingly to other institutions. And that mm -hmm. I think is an important thing which of course, the UN Secretariat can't do anything about it. Member states have to learn to respond to this. If the U of course, Kofi Annan did talk about it and did, did talk about the need for Security Council reform. But I think it is an important area, which perhaps, you know, it used to be something which only Indians talked about, but that's not true. Today, I think in around the world, you have to recognize, and you, as you said, the elephant in the room today is China. Over the last 10, 15 years, China has taken, in a sense, a much great strides because that reflects the change power, the equations in the world. And today, China is is in fact, I mean, it's 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 uh, it, it's reflected in so many international institutions. It is in in fact, it is controlling some of the institutions. It is having various, I mean, the activities which, which, which for example, JPOs and others. Uh, operate inside China, inside uh, the United Nations. It's something which is, it is something which other countries need to look at, and we need also to look at, not just in order to, in, a, a, in terms of competition, to see how the mood in the country, the mood in the world reflects the change situation in the power dynamics of the world and how that is being reflected and how it should be. And I think from that point of view, you will see that, the, you know, despite the, the retreat from multilateralism, which we had over the several years in the past, uh, particularly under the Trump administration, you can't put the gene back into the gene back into the bottle because inter interdependencies have established in the world. The supply chains are changing around the world, and you can't just 
just pretend as if it's, we are going back to the 2000s. So that has to be reflected and it has to be reflected in a balanced way. And I think that ultimately it will always be uh, uh, an intergovernmental organization. No, so it's good that you brought up the Security Council because I, I certainly, I mean, it's it's something which we should talk about and you've, you've kicked us off in that direction. But, you know, I often wonder about, because, you know, the, the current system of the, you know, winners of the world war sitting on this veto power, these five countries, I mean, this is obviously completely wrong and, uh, you know, it's not fit for purpose. There's no debate about that. I mean, everybody could agree to that. The, the thing is that, so in, in a situation like that, let's say that if we believed in an ethical foreign policy and we believe that the problem is actually with the veto power, uh, instead of saying that we want to get in and we want to have veto power, should we not be saying that the veto power should be scrapped? So that's one, Fine. one I, part. My second okay. part. No, let me, let me get let, to you straight away. Let me okay. get to you straight away. If we did not have a veto power, I don't think the UN would have lasted so long. Yeah. Quite frankly, the UN would have wound up at least about 50 years ago. You know, so in a sense, let's be realistic. It is because the major powers know that there are some things that they can actually, they can actually prevent happening if it is in, uh, not in their interest that the UN has survived. So to think that the veto power will not be, will disappear somehow, I think that it's not possible. On the other hand, I, unfortunately, we may all, I mean, ethically, as you said, if you think ethically, you would say that nobody should have a veto power, but I don't know whether that will actually work. Second thing is for us to think that if we join the big boys, we are going to behave more ethically. I think that's also, I, I don't think that's going to work. We are also going to behave like exactly like the big, that the countries that we are criticizing today, because the boot will be in a sense on the other foot and we will, we will rationalize it in terms of our interests and the in, as coinciding with the interests of the world. You're seeing that with China too now. So that is, it's unrealistic to do so. But by having a larger number of permanent members, even I think, I mean, I'm saying something which is quite perhaps contrary to Indian government policy, but I think it is, it, the, it's a veto power. There are certain, we, we should perhaps work for various things, but without a veto power, I don't think the UN would really work, but it is need, you need perhaps to have a larger number of interests, a larger number of opinions continuously pervade per, per, you know, in the UN. And for that, you need to expand the UN, uh, the, the, per, the list of permanent members. I think that is important. And, so, yes. But, sir, sorry, go ahead. So, so, I mean, okay, so we have, the, we have the G4, you know, we have Obama coming to India <clears throat> and saying he's supporting in becoming you know, Security Council membership. Uh, then you have Lavrov come, same thing. Russians say yes, the Americans say yes, the Chinese say no. Uh, so, you know, is India's hope for a Security Council membership as delusional as my hope to end veto power? Uh, you know, I think you know, this thing you said the week, you know, the, the interesting thing about Italy opposes Germany uh, being member of the Security Council, because it says we also lost the Second World War. Now, that's because we should, it's this a very strange kind of, you know, the invariably you will find <clears throat> that just the, 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 the actual, the, the, the actual distribution of world power, I think has to be, has to be recognized. And if you find, if, I, while I think it is, it is unrealistic to think of any major change in the Security Council, uh, co composition for some time, I think but it cannot be pushed or it cannot be put off indefinitely because I think this will represent a breach in the in the in the in the in the in the structure itself will will change if this does not happen. And I think same at the same time, I th it is possible, but perhaps th that's the direction India should look at, and that is to move in the General Assembly for a for a to see if you can get a two thirds majority for recasting the, the, for the opening up the Security Council to at least at least 10 new, at least five more new members, not five. It should be at least a total of 25, uh, 25 members in the Security Council, which will then become much more representative with, with 10 permanent members or 10 or little, or perhaps even 11, depending on what how Africa view works. But give them responsibilities. For example, you know, you, you can't, 
pay 0.7 percent of the budget of the U of the regular budget of the UN and say you want to be a permanent member. At least two to ten percent of the of the of the budget you should be willing to two percent at least. And what the, the 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 what the UN could do, what the member states who want the ex expansion of the Security Council should do is to say that the large number of uh, of uh, LDCs <coughs> actually be, they should their, their their contribution should be waived. Now that will be give a certain amount of balance. Then there should be a certain sense of a kind of contributions in terms of building up regional consensus, etc. Of course, there will be difficulties in most areas, but I think there is slowly, there will inevitably be uh, an understanding that the changed power dynamics right. around, around, in the world will have to be reflected. Otherwise, the, the organization itself is in danger of running into, Renata, into a kind of... A uh, Renata, I was just going to ask you one small sub-question on the Security Council issue, and I, I'm sure, you know, having been in the UN long enough, you follow these things. So, you know, one push we had made through this ACT group was to say, okay, I mean, if you can't get rid of the veto power, can we persuade enough people and Liechtenstein and, you know, some of the sort of, uh, you know, the sm smaller countries got together and said, at least in situations where you have atrocity crimes happening, like genocide, yeah. etc., can we get the P5 to resist from using, to desist from using veto power. Uh, do, do you have a view on this, Renata? Is this realistic? Might happen, or this is also, you know, la-la land? Um, well, again, you know, I think um, most of my work at the UN has not been at the headquarters level. It's been out um, serving in, in, in developing countries around the world, so I'm not the best authority on this. I agree with BJ that, you know, if we did not have the veto power, we probably wouldn't have the UN. Um, uh, and that we're obviously operating in very, very imperfect circumstances. I mean, the, uh, the, 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 the I, I'm going, I'm going back to, you know, it's early, early days under Doug Hammarskjöld, who, who said at that time, and his words are equally um, accurate today, that we are still an, ex you know, the body, the UN body is still an experiment in global cooperation. It's an experiment, and we don't even we don't know whether it's, it's going to actually work in the end. I think that's proved its its worth over the years, um, but of course I'm, I'm I'm partial to it. But um, but it's very very imperfect. Now, in certain dire circumstances, can we you know can we get an uh, an agreement um, to to how shall I say to to act differently? I mean, of course that would be good. That would be great. It's an excellent suggestion. It's uh, what people would say it's a low hanging fruit. Um, why didn't we do it before? Will it actually happen? Of course, it depends on the interests of, uh, of, of, of the big power players in the world. And um, if push comes to shove, uh, will it be honored? Um, that's, so that's Vijay, a dangerous Vijay, question. Let Vijay, me respond to that. Now, Let me laughing. respond to that. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, no. I was saying, Vijay, you're just laughing at, at this, you know, thought that this is even kind of... <laughs> no, no. Let me say, let me respond by that. You know, you're saying genocide. Now, the question is, genocide is a huge thing, particularly, for example, if you're talking of, of the international community talking in, 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 in Srebrenica, they didn't talk about it. In Rwanda, they didn't talk about it. In Yemen, things are happening. In, in, uh, um, in, in Myanmar, people are talking about it. And, and you know, there's this thing about well, Kofi Annan was very hesitant of calling it genocide, but the whole point is, if the international community wants to get, uh, work, get wants to get a kind of a consensus on things, I think we should stop labeling things because you go, you're going to label something genocide, you're not going to have it bet. You can prevent a genocide without saying it is so by getting the community to work in one direction. I no, think no, that which, is very just... important. Just in terms of this particular, I mean, I understand that. I, I, by the way, I was not in favor of amnesty calling it genocide, and it, we didn't call it genocide, whatever happened in Myanmar at the time, because, you know, that, that as you said, it kind of becomes more of a politicized discussion than a substantive yes. one. But my question in relation to the UN Security Council P5 resisting from using or desisting from using the veto powers is not so much about the technical definition of genocide. Uh, you know, it could be crimes against humanity. It is everything that's covered under the ICC's rubric. So, yes. so it's a kind of broader question. But, but absolutely, you were still thinking that this is not 
happen. No, okay, no, I, I think it's, that, what you're saying is abs- I, I'd like to interrupt. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Salil, but I think it's very important. It is, and you, you can actually see that the UN is actually now less and less using the veto, except in very, very obvious cases. And there, most of the time, actually, the veto is something which is a repetition of a past position. Now, in most areas that are evolving, you're finding that countries, that, that the, the, the P5 are looking towards avoiding having to exercise the veto. And I think that is the, that is the way in which you should proceed by having informal consultations. And the UN, particularly the Secretariat, has a big role to play because it is not necessarily through, even when member states actually direct the UN to go in a particular direction, but very often they try to get the UN Secretariat to act in positions that don't actually, you know, that they don't actually get uh, the, the member states to take a very frontal position. And I think that is the, that is the area where increasingly a lot of diplomacy is happening. And I think oh. that is the way in which, for example, any major issue, special representatives are sent, say, you know, Syria. But the only point is there, the question is very often the hubris of individual permanent members. And I think that is a question of leadership. A good Secretary General has to actually say, if you want us, the Secretary General, to send a special representative, etc., you should be willing to listen to what needs to be, you, you, need, you need to hear and not what you want to hear. And that's where a person like Lakdar Brahimi and et cetera is able to hold his own. And whereas other special envoys are not able to hold their own. And I think that is very important ultimately. And that's the way to solve resolve international, in a sense, major problems so, where, so, where differences exist. Yeah. So let me let me uh, Vijay come back to you know we've we've uh, it's kind of given this this uh, today's talk a spicy title of you know what happens to the UN uh, post Trump and I mean you were talking about the P five and the you know I it's always said that the UN is only as strong as its strongest member nations allow it to be the member states allow it to be and for the last four years we've had a president of the United States who is you know pretty explicit that he doesn't believe in the UN, he doesn't believe in multilateralism. And, and now that's where that's changing in a few weeks time, <laughs> inshallah, who knows what these, these people are capable of doing. But I mean, so there's two things here. One is that, you know, uh, what does that mean for multilateralism? And what does it mean for the UN? So does it give it a fresh lease of life? I mean, at one level, the obvious answer is yes. But I'd like to hear from both of you if there's anything more specifically that you might want to indicate that might change. I mean, we know the climate treaty, the US will come back into some things have already been announced. But a uh, part two of the question is, so, you know, we also had kind of a Trump Modi love fest that was going on. And uh, as you know, the first thing that uh, Biden has already announced is there's going to be a global summit for democracy. So, you know, this free reign for, you know, authoritarian tendencies may not last, you know, and so that will have implications for India, for India as well, I think. So, you know, the love fest uh, is a little bit at risk. Of course, U.S.-India relationships go far beyond governments and all of that, and that's a given, and nothing is going to dramatically change. But, you know, this, you know, this Howdy Modi and, and all of that is, that bit is over, right? So, um, so Renata, let me ask you this first to respond to it, and then we'll come back to Vijay. And then I know that we want to leave questions, some time for questions. So if you could both keep your responses short, please. I didn't quite catch your question, Salim. Uh, my question, <laughs> my question oh. in a, so part one, which probably you want to focus on is that, you know, given the change in the US, impending change in the US administration, uh, what is that going to meet, mean for multilateralism and the UN more broadly? And then I asked as to what does it mean for the US-India relations as well? Okay, so for multilateralism, I think, um, first of all, I, I question, I know we talk a lot about, you know, the, the, the retreat of multilateralism or the, the, the how should I say, the, the, the diminution of, of, of multilateralism these days. The and Sorry? The retreat, the or the, yeah. So we, we speak a lot about that. Um, but I think yeah. we also get, 
get caught caught up in headlines. Um, and I really question, you know, I question this. And I, I would like to make a distinction between multilateralism and globalization. I mean, clearly uh, there are responses around the word, world to the kind of globalization that we've pursued um, over the last, you know, 20 years or 25 or, or longer, right? Um, and that's, you know, contrary to the theory that globalization was going to lift, lift all boats equally, uh, that has not happened. Uh, not only between countries, but also within countries. And there's a big backlash against that. And there should be a backlash against that because uh, many aspects of uh, the globalization model that we've been following is deep, are deeply unfair. And we're feeling that. Um, but in terms of multilateralism, I think, you know, with the, with, with the exception of, um, you know, a few countries, most countries are still totally committed to a, a multilateral world. Of course, COVID-19 is also having its impacts on, on that as well as countries um, take a more cautious approach to, um, to, you know, to because of the breakdown in the supply chains, et cetera. And so they're trying to be a little bit more cautious in terms of how, they, how their economies recover um, and more, yeah, more careful about it. But generally, I think that there still is very strong commitment to, to multilateralism. Um, I, I think that you know, we're in one of these sort of moments where you know, a, we need some breakthroughs in multilateralism to sort of bring us up, uh, up to date in terms of the 21st century. Um, mm -hmm. But I still feel that there's a strong commitment. And I think, um, you know, when you have, you know, the superpower of the world that takes a pause, if you like, with respect to its commitment to multilateralism, that obviously has ripple effects. But I think that overall, um, there's still a strong, strong commitment. So I sort of take issue with, the, the, with that premise that, you know, that multilateral, multilateral has take hits, but I don't think that it's a reflection, a generalized reflection of, of most countries in the world who still, who still are strong, strongly committed to multilateralism. And India um, is a good example uh, of that. But I think there's something that more, well, maybe not more, but I think that there's something that we haven't spoken about that I'm deeply troubled about and, and, and concerned with respect to um, uh, how, how it's going to play into virtually everything. And that is the total lack, uh, the, the, the total vacuum in terms of a regularly frame, regulatory framework of this um, information age that we've entered, where we have now companies actually shaping the consciousness of humanity. Um, surreptitiously, sort of invisibly, they're, they're changing our behavioral patterns through their algorithms and their, their deep learning machines, et cetera. And all this is going, this, all this is creating, it's actually bringing some of the worst of humanity to the fore. It's playing to our worst, you know, our, the, our, the, the worst characteristics of, of human beings. It's pulling, it's actually, you know, incentivizing our worst behavior and it's going completely unregulated. And I feel that, you know, when I say sort of reinventing multilateralism to meet some of the challenges of the 21st century, up there with climate change to me is this, this whole uh, lack of an ethical framework for AI, biotech, but, but mostly the information, you know, social media. Um, mm -hmm. And here, I really hope that, you know, with some of the, the great brains that exist in India, that there could be some thinking around this as an offering to the international community at large on how to get a handle of this because we've unleashed, you know, a, a, a dragon that is, uh, has now come back to sting us very hard. And I think the Democrats are certainly quite keen on kind of bringing Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, back in line. So, so what's your take on this, Vijay, on, on uh, Biden? No, I, 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 let me first of all agree completely with Renata on the information, on the need to have some kind of cyber regulation, cyber, the cybersphere regulation and that, I think, and technology generally, the impact of technology and how that will, how much that can be regulated is very important. And I think something is going to come and certainly the, the, the lead will have to come from the technologically, the most advanced countries and those who are subject, those who can actually uh, pay, play a, a role. And here, I think on the one hand, advocacy by the UN with the non-governmental agencies has to, the atmosphere will be built. And secondly, the governments will have to actually come to an agreement on which is the lowest common denominator or the highest common multiple of regulation. Now that's important. Now to come to Biden, I think uh, it is important that 
the reassertion, as it were, of a public reassertion of a belief in multilateralism and in the UN is going to be very important. And I think that will send the signal to most of the countries of the world who, as Renata says, really believe in multilateralism because they don't have very much of an option. Because I, I think otherwise, the kind of things which will happen bilaterally can be much more, uh, much more in, in, in a sense detrimental to their interests and they will need a broader regulation of uh, some of the factors of interdependence in this particular age. And from that point of view, I think the, I think the United States particularly uh, will feel a, a much greater need. And of course, they've already publicly mentioned Linda Thomas-Greenfield has already been identified as the new uh, PR. It's going to be, okay, I think it's going to be a much more hands-on and a much more involved uh, involvement with the UN uh, because they realize that China is, some, is, is a big player now and they will need to, in a sense, at least backstop to prevent the kind of thing from growing. Because I think there is a real fear that they have led, left the, the arena far too long for other uh, players to go. And I think that is going to happen. Now, that is very important. But having said that, I don't know if the old, uh, the old maladies like the hubris of the big powers, the double standards, the question of division within the, the kind of innate suspicions between the United States and, Soviet, and uh, Russia on the one hand and between China will actually help it to, and also sometimes the absence of sustained attention to issues. I mean, the, the big powers are, don't have the time to attend to some of these issues in the sustained. These will have to be, I think I have high hopes in that sense from the, from the, the Biden administration and the US in getting back to an active role in New York and at the various multilateral centers. I mean, second point is regarding India and the UN and, and the US. I think here, despite all that love fest which you talk about and the Howdy Modi and the various things like that, these are appealing to the government in power. I think you know the Indian mentality and as like any other man, we like to keep people cush you know, in a sense, happy. And I think the same thing will happen with the new government. And I don't think that the, that the, 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 the dynamics will change. You will find that uh, the same kind of the attempt will be made. And I think it's important that the chemistry be built. And I think in a sense, John, I mean, uh, Biden's relationship and chemistry with Indian leaders is quite as good. And though, of course, they have talked about his chemistry also with, with Chinese leaders. I think there is a there is going to be a very deep kind of re retrospect uh, introspection which uh, uh, the, the the U.S. will have to do with regard to the long term implications of a relationship, the continuing relationship with China, and what the implications will be. It will have to be it will have to be cal calibrated, and India will be a factor in that ca broader calibration of the United States of its relations, and therefore this democracy things like that is going to happen. While you said that, I also, uh, you know, you talk about autocr autocratic tendencies. Now, that is how you look at it. You would probably say strident, assertive leadership, if you want to look at it in the right, in, in a kind of, in a less uh, in a critical manner. But actually, what is more important, and I think which the, you know, which the United States will continue, is the, the questions relating to uh, you know, the larger aspects of democracy, not majoritarianism. And I think that the United States will probably take a stand on. And I think that will, in effect, in overall effect, in terms of the, large, the, the larger ramifications, will be good for India. And I think it is important that that kind of approach, both by Europe and the United States, takes place for a broader democratize. Uh, a, I mean, there is a very strong, I mean, you can't deny that the Indian government has been based on very strong democratic principles, but it is also getting increasingly majoritarian. And certain other aspects of the welfare of minorities, the sense of security of, of uh, vulnerable sections of the people need to be reassured, an inclusive aspect. And I think these things will probably, there will be a little more pressure on these issues, which I think will come. And I think a, a Biden administration is bound to do that. And I think that will be only for the overall good. Because that, I think, if that is not there, it probably, of course, it will cause certain, certain ripples and things like that. But my own sense is that that is the kind of correction, course correction, which was needed perhaps earlier, but which will come now.
and that's that good. can be expressed. And I think that that will be a good thing eventually. Thank you. Thanks, <laughs> Vijay. Uh, Saurabh Bhandari asks, uh, we already see Security Council so utterly divided on important issues. How can increase of member aid facilitate in the decision making? Won't it simply further uh, add to complexities? Okay. Uh, uh, so you want to just uh, read all four so we can yeah. assign? Go ahead, please. Yeah. Uh, Ram Ganesh Kamatam uh, asks, in both speakers' views, which SDG has seen the most progress in the last five years uh, in the developing world? Which goal has seen worst progress? And in their view, uh, which is what is the UN's biggest normative success in the last five years? Sri Lakshmi Gururaja asks uh, specifically to Renata, how has the UN and India faced the COVID challenge? And uh, our last question from Shekhar Vishwanathan. In comparison to India, has China contributed more or less to the UN? He realizes a quantitative comparison may be impossible, but would the panelists have a view on this? Oh. Thank you, Lekha. So, Renata, very short responses. If you could start on SDGs and COVID. Very short, please. Yeah, yeah sure. I mean, um, maybe I also just mentioned quickly the, on the first question, Obviously, expansion of the Security Council will bring more complexities, but that doesn't mean that it's not needed and can't be managed if uh, approached in a mature manner. On the, on the SDGs, uh, poverty reduction is one um, of the goals where we've seen some incredible progress. And uh, a lot of that global progress is attributable to both China and India being able to reduce um, pov poverty dramatically. Um, over the last years. And uh, our big concern now is how COVID-19 and the impacts of COVID-19 may reverse some of that excellent work that's been done. Um, there are several SDGs that are lagging. Uh, one of them, which is an, an indicator or a goal that's notoriously difficult to actually get a handle on, and that is maternal mortality rates. Uh, maternal mortality rates are, are very difficult to actually, um, uh, they change very slowly over time, no matter how much you do. And so those, that's, for example, an example of, of one that's not doing well. Um, and with regards to the question directly to me on uh, India and how is the UN in India um, facing the COVID uh, challenge, um, I mean, basically, we repurposed a lot of what we did very, very quickly in a two-month two period. A lot of what we did, um, uh, we're, we're doing before was either tweaked or completely reprioritized to help uh, the national response to COVID-19. Um, our WHO office is uh, uh, probably, uh, not probably, it is the largest WHO office in the world and our UNICEF program is the largest UNICEF program in the world and these two agencies in particular, of course along with others, but these two in particular have been doing some really heavy lifting with the Ministry of Health, um, with the Departments of Health uh, at the state level. Um, they have offices across all, all the states and have been working extremely hard to try to you know, assist with the, the, the testing, the, the containment, the, the, the protocols that the health personnel are using in, in health facilities, um, massive training, massive outreach, trying to assist with national efforts to raise the awareness of the need for social distancing. Um, I know that in India, that's a big challenge. Um, part of me is also French, so it's also a big challenge for the French. It's not only an Indian challenge, <laughs> the, the social distancing. Um, et cetera, et cetera. So most of our programs now or a large part of our programs have been repurposed and um, they haven't necessarily strayed from the overall goal, which is you know, improved health access, improved health, improved education, um, improved livelihoods, et cetera. So they're still in the same general areas, but they've all been uh, COVIDified, if I can call it that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, Vijay, I think, could you focus more on the China question? Because- Yeah, it looks I like that's, the, I, I agree with the, with uh, uh, Renata in terms of the the uh, expansion of the council and that effect, because I think ideally then if you were to uh, not have it, to have it very simple is to have just one, you know, <laughs> one security council permanent member, that makes it all very simple. China would probably like that. But anyway, the, to look at the larger picture, uh, I think historically, if you look at the contributions of uh, India over the, over the 75 year period, I think it's been considerable. And in fact, the I would say it's been, particularly during the first uh, two quarters, uh, quarter centuries, 
of the uh, the you know of this 75 years there's been a historical contribution which india has made which i think is there for the record whether it's as i said uh, anti colonialism and all even in the developmental in the whole idea of of uh, human development in a sense though it is amartya sen and uh, and uh, 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 singh uh, uh, mahbubul haq yeah, yeah mahbubul haq but at the same time i think the it, i think india has played a, a great role even in the undp even right from the time of id patel and others but more than that for the over the it has to what is notable is over the last 15 years perhaps 10 to 15 years china's uh, shadow in the united nations has increased enormously i mean exponentially and it has actually today it's 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 doing the the kind of contribution it makes to the un budget for example it's the second largest contributor uh, in terms and is perhaps it's even as large it, it, it's it's outstripped japan considerably even in the uh, in the peacekeeping budget it has gone into peacekeeping in a big way it has given a, a, a billion of dollars for uh, peace and security in the, over a 10 year period it's occupying uh, many of the important positions in the specialized agencies and funds and programs at least four of them fao unido itu and icao and in fact this is in almost causing a certain amount of concern internationally as to what the implications of this is and in fact not just at that level at the top level but even at the lower levels of jpos etc which are financed by china in many parts of the secretariat even in very very strong uh, you know parts of the secretariat including the secretary general's office you find that and that is creating a certain amount of concern uh, all around as to whether or not that is actually you know moving you find even in uh, in in documents certain strong national sort of uh, you know terminologies are being brought in now that is inevitable because perhaps that was what was happening all through over the these 75 years when the west was predominant in the in the un uh, bodies so it is not surprising that this should happen but it is important that the world takes notice and countries like india who in the past have been influential in terms of even the the diplomacy of drafting in, uh, in 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 the united nations is now finding a very strong competitor in the in the in the chinese and i think this is something which will have to be faced and which will come and which is important and i think increasingly this is this is the way in which the direction in which the world is moving the, the the un is moving and we have to take note of it and we should be prepared to be more active the fact is india today is Thank now you. in many ways we are restricting ourselves to the international day of yoga international day of you know, non violence etc those are important there's no doubt they're important but we should get to the nitty gritty of whether it's development or whether it's human rights whether it's in 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 environment and be able to make substantive contributions through having experts both within and in the diplomatic field and this is now for example people talk about how china has suggested that you know we we are running out of time yeah just two thing two points i think it says okay. today very few people know that china is actually use of coal is the largest in the world much it's 50, it's 50 it's much more than india and yet india is getting the flack for actually not committing itself to to a carbon free kind of uh, uh, development and i think that is the kind of it's important that india activates itself in order to be more visible in in both inside the un and in its diplomacy in the un thank you thank you vijay thank you renata i just want to say one thing uh, lekha before we close that you know for those of you who follow the un stuff in india we kind of had a double bill bollywood uh, you know dhamaka film here today because it's like getting shahrukh khan and salman khan to act in the same film together having renata and vijay nambiar so thank you both for for coming here today and you know as far as the un is concerned uh, we always say that if the un didn't exist with all its blemishes etc we have to invent it so so uh, that's that's a reality and you know thank you very much and my apologies to those who asked questions that we couldn't manage the time better but uh, thank you again to bic and all of you for joining us thank you thank you so much thank you
this evening, uh, we heard an interesting conversation around appropriate representation, committee expansion, veto powers, and the need for multiple initiatives to make the UN better. Thank you uh, to all the panelists for giving us a window into the functioning of the United Nations and its place in the world and our place as a nation in the scheme of things. Thank you, Renata, Vijay, and Salil for an enlightening session. Thank you everyone to, who attended and participated. Um, good night and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you so good much. Night. Very good Thank evening you. to everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Renata. Bye-bye, Salil. Bye-bye.